I've talked before how counting is one of the primary ways we're going to calculate the probability of some event. It turns out there's a few more definitions we're going to be working with. Here's the first one from section 5.2. It's the definition of if you have two events, we call those events disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. So what are we talking about? Let's look at an example. We're going to use the random phenomenon of rolling a dice again. So two events we could look at that are mutually exclusive would be rolling an even number. And then event B could be rolling an odd number. And so together we can call these two events mutually exclusive. And another way I like to talk about this sort of an idea is that mutually exclusive events can't both happen at the same time. There's no way you can roll a fair six-sided die and get with one roll an outcome that is both even and odd. And so if we have two disjoint events, then if we think about the probability of them both happening at the same time, that is the probability of A and B, then that probability is always going to be zero because by definition, they can't both happen at the same time. A nice visual way to look at probability problems and events is with what's called a Venn diagram. And these things show events as the circles, and the rectangle represents everything that's possible. So we have an example here where we're selecting a chip, like a poker chip, that have numbers on them. There's 10 of these chips, and they are numbered 0 through 9. And they're saying the event E is going to be if we pick a number less than or equal to 2, and the event F is going to be if we choose a number greater than or equal to 8. We can simplify that by just listing the outcomes that correspond to F, which would be a number greater than 8, greater than or equal to 8, rather. So that is 8 and 9. And for E, we're going to be choosing a number less than or equal to 2. So that's 0, 1, or 2. And we put those numbers in there. And you'll see they don't overlap here, because in this case, E and F are disjoint. And then we have the remaining events out here. So this is just an abstract representation of how to take the entire sample space and just say, hey, some outcomes are in F, some outcomes are in E, some outcomes are in neither, and we show that E and F have no outcomes in common by drawing their circles separately. Here's that same example, and remember we're talking about chips that are kind of randomly being stuck in a bag with numbers on them, which means that our outcomes are all equally likely. The probability of E is the number of ways that E can occur, which is 3, divided by the number of possible outcomes, which is 10, which gives us 30%. The probability that F occurs is the number of ways F can occur, divided by the number of total possible outcomes, which is 20%. And so to find the probability that one or the other occurs, we just have to add the total number of ways one or the other can occur, which is 5, divided by 10, which is 50%. These all come from just simple counting. For a bit of perspective, here's what these same calculations look like with some of the book's notation. So the book says it's telling you to count by using this capital N. I don't use this a lot, but it's just saying count the number of ways E can happen, divided by the number of possible outcomes, do the same thing for F to find its probability, and then do the same thing to find the probability of E or F. If you want to, you can use this formula down here. They have a formula for finding the probability of E or F if they're mutually exclusive. So for right now, I would just say, let's ignore this. All these things come from counting. So here's that rule I just mentioned. If you have two events that are mutually exclusive, aka disjoint, you can find the probability of one or the other by adding the probability of one to the probability of the other. And we would represent that in a Venn diagram by the entire shaded area of E and F.
That rule that we just talked about, which they're giving this name of the addition rule, also works for more than two events that are mutually exclusive. If we have a bunch of events with no outcomes in common, then the probability of one or the other or the other or as many as we have is just all of their probabilities summed up together. And in a Venn diagram, this would look like a bunch of different circles that weren't overlapping at all, and we would just have the probability of E or F or G or whatever other events we want by just adding up all their probabilities separately. And so the important thing here is there's no overlap, which means these events have no outcomes in common. Here's a basic example of how we might calculate some probabilities if we're given a probability model, which is just a fancy word for showing for a particular variable, in this case it's the number of rooms in a housing unit, what are the possible outcomes, and what are the probability of each outcome. So this came from some data, presumably, that somebody had that they took a sample and they calculated what proportion of that sample had houses with different numbers of rooms in them. And they're basically giving empirical probabilities here based off of that data. And then they're going to make a bit of a jump and use this data to talk about, hey, in general, what do we think the probability of saying, say, having a housing unit with one room? is 1% according to this model. So they're asking us to verify this is a probability model. We would just want to add up all these possible outcomes and make sure all their probabilities equal to 1. And if these decimals were calculated from fractions, there might have been some rounding. So all these probabilities might not add perfectly to 1, but they should be somewhere fairly close. If they added up to like 3 or one and a half, that would be a sign that something was wrong. And these ones do add up to exactly one. Then they could ask us something like this, what is the probability we choose a housing unit randomly and that unit has two or three rooms? Well, these are the two outcomes here and all these outcomes are disjoint. So all we have to do to find this probability is add the probability of two rooms plus the probability of three rooms which is 12.6%. So we can find a lot of different probabilities from this probability table. But just as a reminder, if we were finding the probability of two and three rooms, and it's not possible, it's not possible to have a house with both two and three total rooms in it. So this probability is zero. And we knew that already because we said that these were disjoint events, they're mutually exclusive events any mutually exclusive events, the probability of both of them happening at the same time is always zero. So here is another rule they're giving us, but don't worry about all these symbols quite yet. Let's just focus on the idea that we're still talking about any two events, and notice this is any two events. So this is more general than what we were talking about. We don't care what these events are. If you have two events, then the probability of one or the other is some stuff here. Let's just look at these events in a Venn diagram. These events might not be mutually exclusive. And if we have events that aren't mutually exclusive, we draw them having some overlap. And this overlap is the probability of both of them happening. And so when I draw overlap here, I'm saying, hey, this probability is something greater than zero. These events are not disjoint. They're not mutually exclusive. They could both happen at the same time. And so all this is saying is that if I want to have the probability of one or the other, well, that's represented by all this area on the inside. So if I added the probability of E, I get the entire circle of E. And then if I add the probability of F, I'll get the entire circle of F. But notice what happened is this middle region, the probability of E and F, got added twice. So what we need to do is account for that and say, okay, the probability of one event or the other, which is just the total area in this Venn diagram, the total area in these two circles, needs to be the probability of one event plus the probability of the other event, but then we need to subtract that middle area that got added twice. This is what that 
rule looks like, but it's not really anything I ever feel like I have to memorize because I just remember the Venn diagram. And if I have some overlap, then I got to make sure I get rid of that overlap so I don't accidentally add it twice. But notice that this actually works for mutually exclusive events too, because mutually exclusive events, there's no overlap. So if I want to find the probability of one or the other, I can add the probability of one plus the probability of the other. But remember that if these events are disjoint or mutually exclusive, that the probability of both of them happening is zero. So this rule really becomes exactly like that other one we talked about if we've got mutually exclusive events, where it's just the probability of one plus the probability of the other. So let's see what this looks like with a quick example rolling two six-sided dice. So as a reminder, here's the sample space for all the ways you can throw two six-sided dice. And so we could call this first column here die one and the second column die two. So we're saying, okay, suppose that a pair of dice are thrown, and E is going to be the first die is a 2, and F is going to be the sum of the dice is less than or equal to 5. And so this says find probability of E or F, and it's telling us to use this rule, but in this case, because we do have classical probabilities, we can just count here. Let's think of the ways E can happen. The first dice is a 2, so that's going to be this row right here. Now we want to think about f, that's the sum of the dice is less than or equal to 5. So how many ways can we do this? Okay, this one, and then anything 5 or less. So I'm going to make this stair step looking pattern. So I just drew that between the 5 and 6 totals, and then all these ones count too. It says find the probability of e or f, and I really do think using those rules makes it seem a little bit harder than it is, because all I need to do is count. How many ways can E happen? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many ways can F happen? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There aren't seven ways that F can happen, but there's seven ways that aren't included in E. So what do I want to say? I want to say the probability of E or F is the six ways E can happen plus the seven ways that F can happen that aren't already included, divided by the total number of ways, which is 36. So we get 13 over 36. So because this is just a classical probability, I'm just counting, I could find a lot of complicated looking probabilities by just counting. Let's look at the other way just to see what it would look like if we were using the general addition rule. So the general addition rule says, okay, we need to find the probability of E, which is the first die is a 2, and we need to add the probability of F, which is the sum of the dice is less than or equal to 5. So let's just do that math. The probability of E or F is the probability of E is the probability of E, which is the number of ways E can occur, which we already counted was these six ways here. So the probability is 6 over 36. And we're going to add the probability of F. So how many ways can F happen? That was these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 ways. So the probability of F is 10 over 36. And then we want to subtract the probability of E and F. What is that? That's the probability of having both of these events happen. So that means those are all the results where the first die is a 2 and the sum is less than or equal to 5. These three pairs of dice right here are all the ways that you can have both of those events happen. These three pairs of dice are both less than or equal to 5 and also have their first die being a 2. So that probability is 3 out of 36, and we're going to get the same result, 13 out of 36, which we said was 36.11%. So for this case, using this general addition rule almost makes it seem more complicated than it is. Because we have classical probabilities, all we needed to do was just count. But sometimes we might have to use the general addition rule if we don't have classical probabilities and we have to figure out the probability of one event or the other happening, and we can't just count. And in that case, you can always say, sum the probabilities and then subtract their overlap. That works 
every time for trying to find the probability of two events, whether they're mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive in the case of this example.